Anyway, we're going to continue in our heart series uh, today. And, and this is, I, I think I say this on every series I do. This is one of the important ones, right? Um, even the Bible says this, uh, Proverbs 4.23, it says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Guard your heart above all else. Okay? And so... You know, last week we kind of dove into what that looked like as far as what it means to guard your heart, to protect it. Uh, and I gave you all the JIV version of this last week. Anybody know what the JIV version is? The Joe Ensel version? Don't put a lot of stock in it, please. Um, <clears throat> but it says, protect your thoughts, your emotions, and your desires for this determines where you end up in life. Okay, see, when it talks about the heart, guard your heart, that's talking about your soul. This is the part of us that wasn't redeemed at salvation. You know, when we got saved, there was something that happened instantly on the inside of us. Our spirit man came alive and, and, and we were able to connect with God uh, in that moment. But there's a part of us that's our soul that was left untouched uh, initially by our salvation. And, and this is the thing that we're working on in, in, in our lifetime is that, you know, the Bible talks that we are, are being saved. We're saved, but we're being saved at the same time. And, and the process that we go through, uh, we could call it sanctification. We could throw out some, uh, some big, big theological terms if you'd like. Uh, but this is the process of God changing you from the inside out. This is your soul. This is your mind. This is your emotions. Uh, this is your will. It, it's all of these parts that make up the inside of you. And, and uh, the writer of Proverbs says, above all else, protect this. Okay? Protect your thoughts. Protect your will. Protect your emotions. Protect these things because the enemy is coming to attack it. And, and, and this is what controls where you go in your life, all right? When you got saved, your salvation uh, is, is sealed. The Bible tells us that when the Holy Spirit comes in our life, it's a seal of our salvation uh, in our life. But there's another part of us that needs to be redeemed, and it's the soul. And, and this is, determines how we live in this life, all right? And so this is why we need to protect it. Protect your thoughts, your emotions, and your desires, for it determines where you end up. And so in this series, we're talking about different things that we need to protect our hearts from. And, and so we're looking at different areas, uh, different, uh, uh, different areas where the enemy is going to attack us in. Not if, but when he attacks us in. Last week, we talked about the lies and the deceit uh, of our enemy. You know, the, Jesus said that the, the devil is the, the father of lies. He's a liar and he's the father of all lies. And so his main thing is he wants to come and he wants to whisper something in your ear that is a lie that will get you off track. And if, if you're not guarding your thoughts, then you'll be tricked. You know, we looked at the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. The, the enemy came in and he lied to them and got them to eat the fruit and which caused sin to come into the world. Uh, last week we looked at uh, when Jesus was tempted. He was baptized and he was uh, drawn out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. And we read how the enemy came and he used scripture to lie to Jesus to try to get him uh, to, to, to sin. And, and we saw how he came back with scripture. So how do we defeat the lies of the enemy? With the truth. The truth. See, if you don't know the truth, you won't recognize the lie. All right, this is what we talked about last week. If you don't know the truth, you won't recognize the lie because the enemy will take a little bit of truth and mix a little lie into it. That still makes it wrong, right? It still makes it a lie. And he will trick a lot of people into believing things <clears throat> because it sounds good, but it's actually a lie. And so that was last week we talked about that. It's online if you want to go listen to it. <clears throat> Today I want to talk to you about another area that we need to guard our hearts in. And, and, and this area is the area of offense. Offense. And, and this is a big one. Because we live in a society that loves to be offended. All right? You can't hardly say anything, post anything online without somebody getting offended by it. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and, and, and they feel like they need to comment on it, right? They feel like they need to throw in their two cents. and, and what, what, Anyway, that's a whole other issue. 
<clears throat> I'm offended at social media, okay? <laughs> no. But offense, being offended is, is something that we must guard our heart against. Because what is offense? What is offense? At, at the bottom level, someone says something, someone does something that makes you angry, they insult you, they do something, and you get, a, get offended by them, right? Then what begins to happen in your heart? If you allow this offense to sit there for a little while, it begins to change your heart. It brings anger. It brings resentment. It brings a lot of things into our hearts that don't need to be there. And, and, and ultimately, the bottom level of offense is unforgiveness. And when we have unforgiveness, then we have stopped the work of God in our life. Okay? We're going to talk about this today. We're going to get there. <clears throat> and, and so I looked up offense in the dictionary because that's what I do. I like to know stuff. <clears throat> and it says this, offense is an annoyance or a resentment brought on by a perceived insult to or disregard for oneself or standard or principles. It, it comes from a Latin word that means to strike against. It means a hurt or a displeasure. This is what an offense is. This is what the dictionary says it is. <clears throat> and I love how it says this. He said, annoyance or resentment brought on by a perceived insult. A lot of times we'll get offended by somebody about something that they said. We perceived that they insulted us, but they didn't mean to. Has anybody ever been here? Has everybody, anybody ever done that to somebody accidentally? You've said something to somebody and all of a sudden they're mad at you and you're just like, what, what did I do? What did I say? I don't understand. It, it wasn't purposeful. You didn't mean to hurt their feelings. <clears throat> and so it was a perceived by them that you insulted them. Oh, this is where it gets tricky, right? It gets tricky. <clears throat> I like to say this to the teenagers. He's like, you know, we're always worried about what people think about us, right? That, that's something that's always on our minds. Like, what do people think about me? And I like to tell them, says, you don't have to worry about that because they're probably not thinking about you at all because they're so wrapped up in themselves. All right, they don't even, they might not even know you exist. They, they don't have a thought of you, okay? Because they're so selfish and wrapped up in themselves. And so a, a resentment brought on by a perceived insult. I love this in Proverbs 19. It said, a person's wisdom yields patience and it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. I love that. He said, it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. Here's the thing, guys. You're going to have plenty of opportunity in your lifetime to be offended. And let me tell you something. Some people, this is their thing. Like they are good at holding a grudge. Have you ever known one of these people like, like they take pride and like, I've been holding a grudge against my brother for 20 years now. What for? I don't remember, but I'm still holding the grudge. You know, you know what I'm saying? It, it is ridiculous. Because when we hold a grudge, when we have an offense against somebody, what does it do to you? A lot of times the other person doesn't even know. Well, they offended me. I'm never talking to them again. That'll show them. They don't even know you're offended. But it eats you up on the inside and everything that you see and everything you do is shaded by that offense. You look at life through the lens of offense at that point, of unforgiveness, and everything is negative at that point. This is what offense does to us. And so it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. Let me tell you something. If you can get a hold of this principle of forgiving quickly, your life is going to be a whole lot better. A whole lot better. Okay? We're going to dive into this today. 
And so as I begin to think about this, I, I begin to think, you know, what causes offense? What is it that would cause an offense in somebody's life? And so I started making a list. And, you know, I, I started off with misunderstanding. You know, a lot of times an, uh, an offense comes from a misunderstanding. Like you said something and, and I misunderstood you. Uh, it could come from misinformation. It can come from a miscommunication. It could come from a chip on your shoulder. Is Whitman here today? Is that, no, he's not. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> inside joke on that one. Sorry. But the more I thought about it and, and the more I prayed about it, God gave me one word. Where offense comes from. And this may offend some of you, but that's okay. We're talking about offense today. The main cause of offense is selfishness. You mean selfishness on the person that offended me? No, on your own selfishness. When you become offended, it's because you're selfish. Now, now, now hear me out. By the end of this lesson, I'm, I'm hoping that you will agree with me on this statement, okay? Because I'm going to take you through Scripture, and I want to show you some things today that, that will get us to this conclusion. <clears throat> that when I become offended at someone, it's because I'm being selfish, <laughs> okay? The root of all offense is selfishness. Now, let me say something real quick. When you get offended, I know that that pain is real. I, I'm not trying to discount your feelings. I'm not trying to discount the pain of somebody saying something to you or doing something to you that hurts. Hurt is real. It's something that we all deal with. And, and I'm not trying to make light of hurt or, 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 or past things that people have done to you, okay? That the feeling is real. The emotion is real. The hurt is real. And I, I'm not discounting that at all. But what I'm saying is, is somehow you need to learn to let go of all of that. Okay? You need to learn how to deal with this in a healthy way to where it does not affect your entire life. To where everything that you see and everything that you do is shaded by this thing that somebody else did to you. See, when you do that, you allow that person to control your life. You allow that person to control your thinking. And a lot of times that's what a predator wants to do is they want to control you. A lot of times they can do it through your own thoughts. And so we've got to learn how to deal with offense in our life. Because when we do, it brings freedom to our life. Okay? And, and this is where I want to go today. And, and I want us to get us there. And so, but here's the thing. As Christians, we've got to learn... And this is a hard thing to learn, that life is not about you. When we give our lives to him, when we give him control of our lives, we say, God, this is all about you. I want you to come in and control my life. I want you to, to show me where I need to go, what I need to say. And, and you make life about him now. And it's not about you anymore. All right. And, and, and this is the struggle that we have as Christians, is that we still make life about us because in our society today, that is what social media is about. It's all about me. Look at me. Look at my life. Look at this great quote that I have. You know, look at my vacation. Look at this. And, and it's all about look at me, look at me, look at me. And life is about me. You want to impress people by your photos. You want to impress people by your intellect. You want to impress people. And, and, and we have to be careful as believers because we will use social media to post our scriptures and post this and post this. And, and, and a lot of times it's done out of a good heart, but if we're not careful, we'll make it about us and think, I want people to think I'm spiritual. I, I want people to think that I am godly. And so I'm going to post all it. We put our best life forward on social media. That's what we do, right? I have yet to post, you know, see anybody post about how, how you and your wife had a fight and that how you called her some names and then now you're sleeping on the couch. I've not seen that post yet. Anywhere on social media. <laughs> all right? And, and, and so uh, we live in such a society that's all about self-promotion that we bring that into our Christianity as well. And we've got to be careful because when you give your life to Christ, life is not about you anymore. It's about him and what he wants to do in your life. So what happens when we get offended? What happens when, when, when an offense comes into our life? 
Someone says something, someone does something that we are insulted by, right? We're insulted by someone is coming against us. And if we go back to the definition, and it's an annoyance and a resentment brought on by a perceived insult or a disregard for oneself. And so when we get offended, basically you're saying, well, what about me? You did this thing because it's something that you wanted to do, but what about me? You disregarded my feelings. You disregarded what I think. You disregarded my principles. You disregarded my standards. And I'm mad at you now. I'm offended at you now. And, and so what happens is <clears throat> when we get offended, we, we take on this thing and, and, and it just eats our lunch at that point. It's, it's, it just constantly just churns on the inside of us that this person would have the gall to say that. This person would have the gall to do that to me. How, why would they do that? Why Don't they care about me? Don't they know I'm important too? Don't, don't they? And, and we get into this pity party and, and, <clears throat> and what begins to happen is if we let this sit on us, then we start to walk in unforgiveness. We start saying, this person is not worthy to be forgiven for what they've done to me. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let me clarify something. We're all going to have an opportunity to become offended. Hurt feelings will come to us. Okay? We have a choice on what we do with those feelings. Okay? Does this make sense? We have a choice of what we're going to do with this, okay? Because nobody can force anything on you, right? Not even God does that. God does not force anything on you. And, and so when something happens to us, we have a choice on how we're going to respond to that thing. Are we going to allow this person to make me angry for the next six months? Or am I going to allow this thing just to just slide off my back? Because one thing that I know about life is hurting people hurt people. And a lot of times when someone comes to hurt you, to insult you, to, to whatever, usually it's not about you, but it's about them and about a hurt that they've had in their life. Some people, that's all that they know is hurt. And they don't know how to have a healthy relationship where they don't hurt somebody else. And if you're not careful, they're going to suck you into that life and then you're going to be that way too. But you have a choice on what you're going to do with this thing that someone's placed on your life. Are you going to allow it to consume you? Or are you going to be like Elsa and let it go? <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, that one just slipped out. But offense equals unforgiveness. Offense equals unforgiveness. See, when someone hurts you, a lot of times we think that if we forgive somebody, then they, that we release them from what they did. But that's not what forgiveness is about. Forgiveness is not about releasing the person from what they did. Forgiveness releases you from the hurt, but it doesn't release them from the responsibility of what they did. And I think that's what we do when we don't want to forgive somebody is like, I don't want to release them from the responsibility of what they've done to me. And so as long as I'm offended at them, then I have control. No, you just gave up control. Because when you forgive someone, you release yourself from that pain, that hurt that is going on. But you still want them to be held responsible for what they did. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Okay? There is nothing that happens in this life that God doesn't know about. And let me tell you something. He can take care of it better than you can. Okay? So if we're really trusting God, we need to not only trust Him with the good stuff in our life, but we need to trust Him with the bad stuff in our life too. We need to trust Him with those hurts, those things that, that I want this person to pay for that. Let me tell you something. God can handle that a lot better than you. You being offended at somebody and, and talking bad about them is nothing. Okay? Let God deal with them. Now, in saying that, we're like, God, get them, right? 
God, break their legs, God. <laughs> Someone might have prayed that about you, right? <laughs> Forgiveness releases you from the hurt, but it doesn't release them from their responsibility. Let God take care of that side of it. All right, real quick, I want to take us through Scripture. You know, the disciples dealt with offense in their life, all right? Did y'all know that the disciples were not perfect? All right, if you've read your New Testament, you know this, that they're, you know, they, Jesus didn't look for the perfect people to be his disciples. And so uh, I love looking into the disciples and seeing the different personalities and different things going on. Uh, they were definitely not perfect. Like, like Peter, I love Peter, all right? He was the alpha personality. He, he was the one that was going to act. He was the one that was going to say something. I mean, that was him. And, and, and Peter was, was impulsive. He almost cut a dude's head off once, man. Like while he, after he'd been with Jesus for three, he almost cut a dude's head off. You know, I mean, he was an impulsive guy. You know, we, we can look at John and, and, and I see John as like that passive aggressive type guy. Uh, you know, he didn't always just come in, kind of come out and say what he, he was thinking. You know, he kind of, you know, we can see this in, if you ever read uh, the gospel of John, he refers to someone as the disciple that Jesus loved. Who is he talking about? He was talking about himself, right? The disciple that Jesus loved. You know, I was Jesus' favorite, okay? You know, I mean, that seems kind of passive-aggressive to me. But, you know, Paul had to rebuke Peter at one time. We can look at that in the book of Acts. You know, Peter was doing something that was shady. He was treating the Gentiles different than he was the Jews, and Paul called him on it. And so there was, you know, there was a lot of stuff that was going on within the disciples. You know, they dealt with, with offense. They dealt with anger. They dealt with selfishness. And so I want to read some scripture to you today real quick. Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> We're going to start in verse 1 here. Now, I don't know if you've ever hung out with a group of guys before, all right? But there's, there's a dynamic when there's a group of guys hanging out that there's always some kind of competition going on, right? <clears throat> there's always some kind of competition. You always want to be the best at something when you're with a group of guys, okay? <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, if, if a guy tells a story, someone else has got to one-up him, right? Well, I caught a 10 you know, 10 inch fish the other day. Oh, you won't believe. I caught a 13 inch fish <clears throat> two days. Well, listen to this. I caught a shark. You know, you know and, and there's always just like this weird competition thing. <clears throat> we don't know why we do it. We just do it, okay? It's part of our DNA. So, Matthew 18 1. <laughs> listen to this. So, at this time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? All right. Now, we don't have any background. We don't know kind of the, you know, what the disciples were thinking. We don't know why they asked this question. All right. And so, but this, this seems like a guy type question. Okay. Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's the best? Who's your favorite? You, you know, you, you, I don't know if that was the, the nuance of the question, but this was the question that came out. It was a group of guys came up to Jesus and asked him this. And I love his response that he called a little girl to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus just flipped the script on them just real quick. They're like, who's the greatest, Jesus? Who's the best? You know, who's going to be there? I mean, who's going to be at the top at the end? You know, there's always the, the, the talk about, you know, who's the goat in basketball? And we all know it's Michael Jordan. But anyway, um, you know, there's always that talk of, you know, who's the best? And, and, and they're like, you know, so who, who's the best, Jesus? Who's the top in the kingdom of heaven? He's, he's like, guys, you don't understand. You don't understand. you got to take the lowly position to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And he, he's trying to teach them something here. But as with most people, you know, we're a little dense and it takes us a few times to hear some things before we catch on to what's going on. That they didn't quite get what he was talking about yet. 
They were talking about who's the greatest, and he's talking about the lowly position. He's like, you've got to take the lowly position of a child if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let's go to Matthew chapter 20. Just two chapters later, something interesting happens amongst the disciples that we figured out that they still didn't get it. All right. So Matthew 20, verse 20. You know, Jesus was talking about a parable here, the, the workers in the vineyard, and then Jesus predicts his death for the third time, and then, then this happens. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down before him, and asked a favor of him. And so here we go. We got James and John are the sons of Zebedee. So it's James and John and their mom. They're coming to Jesus, and, and they're going to ask for a favor. And what is it you want, he asked. I'm sure it wasn't in that tone, but... <laughs> What is it you want? No. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at the right and the other on the left in your kingdom. What was she asking? <laughs> what was she asking Jesus? You know, it, it, when it comes to, you know, a king, the one who sits at the right and the left hand of the king are people of power. You know, they're, they're important people. They're, they're the number two and number three in the kingdom. And so she came with her sons. So James and John were part of this. They knew what was going on. And she said, can you make my sons number two and number three in your kingdom? I love Jesus' response to this. He says, you don't know what you're asking. Jesus said to them, can you drink of the cup that I am going to drink? We can, they responded. They had no idea what they were about to, what they were agreeing to there. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right and, or at my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared by my Father. Can you see what we're, can you see that they haven't got it yet? There's like, God, we want to be at the top. We want to be your number two and your number three. Right? And so what happens? Verse 24, it says, When the ten heard this, the other ten, the other disciples, when they heard this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Okay, that's a nice word of saying they were hacked off because they asked first. Right? Like, oh man, I wanted that position. Oh man, I wish I had asked first. They beat us to it. And they were, the Bible says that they were indignant, which is... Uh, a, a good word, you know, but I don't think it, it translates into English like it, that, this word indignant means that they were angry, they were irritated, they were resentful, and they were displeased with James and John. They were offended, in other words, at James and John for this. They were indignant, they were mad, they got offended because of this. And so that's what that word indignant means. If you look indignant up in the dictionary, it means feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what is perceived, there's that word again, as unfair treatment. They perceived that they were being treated unfairly because they wanted that position too. So they became offended at them too. Here comes Jesus again. Don't you know that Jesus was just like, come on guys. <laughs> Really? We've talked about this. Have you ever had this conversation with your children? Come on, guys. We've talked about this. How many times do we got to keep having this conversation? When are you going to get it? You know what I'm saying? Verse 25. Jesus called them together and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. This is about to be a teachable moment for them. Have you ever had one of these conversations with your children? It's like, you know, all your other friends are doing this, but that's not how we do things in this family. Have you had this conversation before? That's not how we're going to do things. That's not how we're going to live. All right? And, and this is the conversation he's had. He said, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom 
for many. He's trying to get this lesson across again to the disciples. The first one, if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you got to take the lowly position of a child. If you want to be the greatest, then you must become the servant and the slave of others. He's trying to teach them something here that, that, that they're not getting. We don't want to hear that, that we're going to be the servants if we're going to be the best. We want to be the best. We want to be the top dog. We want to be the one that tells everybody what to do. Do you know that the best bosses are the ones that serve their employees? The best bosses are those who sacrifice for the company. They just don't sit up in the office and bark people around and tell people what to do. But they're in there and they're serving alongside and, and they're showing and, and, and they're a part of it. They're servants. And, and we've got to learn this as believers. That it's not our jobs to be the top dog. Let me tell you something. You don't want to be the top dog in the kingdom of heaven. He died on a cross. Okay. Now he's asked us to take up our cross daily. So we're drinking the same cup. But let me tell you something. If you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you need to learn how to serve other people. All right? God has given you spiritual gifts. He's given you talents. And it's not to bring glory to you, but it's to bring glory to Him and to serve the body. To serve this world. And, and so if we want to be great in the kingdom of God, if we want to make an impact in this world for God, let me say it this way. If you want to make a big impact in this world for God, you've got to learn to serve. All right. And this isn't a pitch to get you to serve in team kids or in our children's ministry. But if God's calling you to that, you need to humble yourself and serve in that area. We all need to learn to be servants in our life. All right. And it's not always in the four walls of the church where we need to be thinking about being servants. When you are at your work, you need to be a servant. You need to learn how to serve your boss. You need to learn how to humble yourself and do some things that's below your pay grade. If the boss asks you to do it, well, that, well, why don't you make him do it? You need to learn to humble yourself and do that. We're not talking about that right now, but that's okay. But in this moment, the disciples, the ten were indignant. They were offended at this. There was anger. There was resentment. They, they felt like they had been wronged in some way in this. And Jesus came and says, hey, listen, guys. Listen, you're missing the point. You're not being mistreated, but we're teaching you how to serve. See, a, 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 a servant, a true servant cannot be selfish. Okay, a true servant cannot be selfish. You can't just pick and choose what you obey God in. Okay. A, a, a true servant is one when God says go, you say, yes, sir. You don't say, but wait, God. Have you ever told God, but wait, but wait, God, hang on a second. I got some questions. Moses did that, right? Burning bush, awesome experience. He said, I need you to go to, to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. He said, but wait, God, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. What if I can't do it? What if, what if, what if, what if? It's okay to have those questions, but don't let those questions stop you from being a servant. See, he said, okay, God, anyway. Because let me tell you something, when God asks you to do something, there's lots of times that you won't feel equipped to do it. You won't feel like you can handle this. But you know what? If God asks you to do it, he's already equipped you to do it. He's already empowered you to do it. And so you need to trust and step out and do that thing. And, and it's called being a servant. It's called humbling yourself and trusting God. And, and you can't do that if you're selfish. Does this make sense? Okay, you're not going to step out in faith on something God asks you to do if you're too worried about self. See, when we become Christians, we put self on the back burner and we put God on the front burner saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. And so when God says, hey, I want you to go start this ministry, 
I want you to go pray with this person. I need you to quit your job and move here because I have something there for you. If you're selfish, are you going to be a true servant? Are you going to step out in faith? If we're trusting God, we'll say, yes, sir, let's do this thing. Now, there's going to be reserve there. There's all that's going to be there. I'm not trying to discount any of that. But a true servant cannot be selfish. And so what happens in this? Because when an offense comes to us, the feelings are real. The hurt is real. All of that stuff is real. My question to you, are you ruled by your feelings? Or are you going to be ruled by what God says? Are you going to be ruled by your feelings of hurt? Or are you going to trust God? See, we need to learn to make a decision. We need to learn to make a decision to forgive before the offense comes. Okay? And so it's not a question if the offense comes. When the offense comes, you need to pre-decide that you're going to forgive whoever offended you. Why? Because that's what God wants you to do. Okay? Because that's what God wants you to do. See, our decisions need to be greater than our feelings in this. Are we going to be ruled by our feelings or are we going to be ruled by our convictions in this life? James chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. For human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all of the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. He said human anger, your offense is not going to glorify God. All right. It's not going to bring righteousness into your life. And so it says, so get rid of the filth and the evil things. What is he talking about here? He's talking about sin. Sin is selfishness, isn't it? He said, so, so get rid of the selfishness and humbly accept the word that God has planted in your hearts. For it has the power to save your soul. We've got to learn to give the right of God's word to be more strong in our lives than our feelings. We got to get let God's word have priority over our feelings. Say, God, I'm going to trust your word. What does his word say? Let's go back to Matthew 18 real quick. Then we'll wrap this thing up. Oh, my. Matthew 18, verse 21. Jesus tells a parable. So then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother and sister who sinned against me? Up to seven times? I think Peter felt like he was being generous in this, right? Right? Because a lot of times we're just like, I'll give you one chance, right? And so he is like, I'll give him seven chances, God. Does that sound good to you, Jesus? Seven. If I forgive someone seven times, I feel like I'm holy, right? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. This translation says 77 times. Other translation says 70 times seven, right? What is that? Someone do the math real quick. 70 times seven is what? 490 times, right? He said, you need to forgive somebody, this one person, 490 times. Now, was Jesus making a, an exact mark? Like, okay, if they do it 491 times, you don't have to forgive. Is that what Jesus was saying? No, because you're not going to keep, some of y'all might keep up. I don't know. You might have an L pen. Forgave you once. All right, you're on number 10. You know, <laughs> some of y'all might be keeping a notebook. I don't know. But, but what he's saying here, he said it doesn't matter. 
forgive. Then he goes into this parable. He said, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servant. So he, so he began to settle them. And a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he couldn't repay it, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees and before him, says, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master looked, looked, took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. He said, you don't owe me anything. At this point, wait. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants that owed him a hundred silver coins. Did y'all catch that? 10,000 bags of gold versus a hundred silver coins. Right? He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees and begged, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told the master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. And he said, you wicked servant, I canceled all of your debts. All of the debts of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have the same mercy on your fellow servants as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should, be, should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers or sisters from your heart. Yeah, that's right. Ouch. This is how your heavenly father will treat you if you don't forgive your brothers and sisters. Not just with your mouth, but from the heart. So many times people say, I forgive you, but they bring it back up next time. They start treating you different. Oh, I forgive you, but there's no buts in forgiveness. All right? If you forgive, Jesus said, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he removes our sin from us. Like, you're separated from that. You're, that's no longer a part of you. When we forgive somebody, we need to forget. We need to act like it never happened. So why is, unfor why is offense, being offended, such a bad thing? Offense equals unforgiveness. Unforgiveness equals selfishness. All right? We have been forgiven of so much in our lives. Jesus has forgiven us of all. Every thought, every word, every misdeed, anything that we've ever done in this life was wiped away by the blood of Jesus. So we must be willing to forgive much. 10,000 bags of gold, 100 coins of silver. God has forgiven us of this. Why can't we forgive for this? Okay? This is why I said offense equals selfishness. All right? If we've been forgiven of this, then surely we could forgive someone because they said something about my dog. Right? Because they, they said something. They, they did something. It hurt my feelings. Well, you know how bad you've hurt God's feelings with your sin? You know what you did? You know what you've done? And God forgave everything. And so it is selfish of us to not forgive the people that hurt us. Why? Because life is not about you. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. That needs to be our motto in life. That's what we need to be doing. We need to be, our life should be about seeking to save that which is lost. We cannot seek and save that which is lost if we're offended at the lost. At the very people that God wants us to reach, we cannot do anything if we're offended at them. If we're angry and we hold resentment against them because we're going to look at them in anger. And that does not produce the righteousness of God. So I want to go back to that statement. The main cause of offense is selfishness. 
Because you will not forgive when you've been forgiven of so much. Again, I'm not trying to make light of what's happened to you in your life, the things that have been done and the things that have been said. But what I'm saying, if you want freedom from that, you've got to forgive. You've got to learn to give that thing to God. And it's not a one-time thing that you're going to do. You're just going to, okay, I forgive, and that's it. Sometimes it's a daily thing that you have to forgive. Sometimes it's a daily thing that you've got to get on your knees and say, God, I need your help. Help me to forgive. God, help me to let this person get this pain out of my heart. But I believe that as you begin to do that, you'll begin to see life in a whole new way. You'll begin to see people in a whole new way. One of my prayers that I always try to pray is that God help me to see people as you see people. He sees people with love and compassion. If you're offended, you're not going to see anybody with love and compassion, but with hatred. So we got to learn to forgive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today, God, for that you've forgiven us of so much. God, I pray that we help us to guard our hearts against offense. God, and the best way to do that is not wait till you're offended and you're a month into it. But God, help us to make a decision to forgive before the offense comes. God, that when someone says something about us or does something to us, we can immediately say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing, as Jesus did on the cross. God, help us to live life free from unforgiveness, from offense, so that we can live life for you and for your glory. God, we thank you and we love you for all that you do. Real quick, we're going to sing a worship song. Let's get on our feet. Prayer team, come forward. Today, you may be facing an offense that's so big in your life that you can't see anything else. Bring that to God today. Please, don't let this go on another minute in your life. Bring that to God today. You can come up here and pray. You can come kneel at the altar. You can do it at your seat. But please take care of this today. Because you have stopped the work of God in your life because you refuse to forgive. Let's worship.